as he stood on that dirt road and looked at the next house, it might as well have been a thousand miles away. He was so tired. His cheaply cobbled worn shoes had rubbed painful grooves into his feet. That right leg he had broken so badly as a teenager seemed to scream with every limping step, No! You can't go any further. You still have to take yourself back to your horse and buggy. Briefly listening to the arguments of his brain, John Vassar stopped and pulled off his hat, took a white handkerchief from his pocket and wiped the summer sweat from his brow. A dusty gust of wind blew across the road from those Midwestern farm fields. He was in the middle of nowhere. The days behind him were not much different from the days ahead of him. Traveling from town to town, village to village, even house to house, trying to sell to the ones who could buy and give to the ones who couldn't the precious pages he carried in the heavy satchel hanging from his shoulders. A satchel that had not only dug a deep groove in the base of his neck, but had the ability to become heavier and heavier as the sun sank low. Am I really accomplishing anything, he would ask? Is it really worth it? He felt so powerless. The woman from the house he just left was in a bad way. They were so poor and in need. All she could do was weep over her husband. What a wicked man. He would taunt her devotion to God. He would rage in anger every time she hinted at going to church. He was disgusted every time she bowed her head in prayer. John felt so helpless. All he could do was listen to her and pray. As he started to leave, she begged him for one of the Bibles that he carried in his satchel. He gladly gave her one. Yet as he continued on his journey, he felt as though he had done so little for the poor woman. It was just at that moment when John was at his lowest, tired and hungry, wondering if it was all worthwhile, a gentle breeze of the heaven blew across his soul as he was reminded of the miracle that God had wrought in his own heart not too long ago. How that the Jesus that he encountered transformed his life from darkness to light, from blindness to sight, from death to life. As tears began to well up in his eyes and a smile creeped across his sun-baked cheeks, he thought, there is no telling what God can do with that one little Bible that I left in that woman's hands. And you know what? He was right. I'm Ronnie Brown, and this is Forgotten. Although his name is largely forgotten more than 200 years after his birth, if you had been living in rural America in the mid to late 1800s, chances are you would have recognized his name. John Ellison Vassar was one of the most widely known evangelists in the United States in the 19th century. He was born on January 13, 1813 to Thomas and Joanna Vassar of Poughkeepsie, New York. Thomas and his brother James had immigrated to the United States from Norfolk, England in 1796. They were Baptists in their beliefs and found the restrictions of the state church oppressive. When in America, they began to apply themselves as farmers planting the first crop of barley in Dutchess County. Then they began to brew an ale, which they sold to supplement their income. Their brew became so popular that they sold the farm with James starting a brewery and Thomas opening up a brickyard. From the age of 12, John worked at his father's brickyard. He was a tireless worker who was tough and earnest in character. Yet to his parents' disappointment, he seemed to have no place for God in his life. He had a quick temper and at times a foul mouth. When he was around 20 years old, While hurriedly running across a log bridge, his leg slipped through the cross beams and was badly broken. 
His parents had hoped that the incident would cause him to assess his spiritual condition before God. And although the incident did cause him to have plenty of time to think about his life, recovery, not conversion, was the result. John was laid up for several months, after which the leg never properly healed. This left John with a limp for the rest of his life. By the time he was 25, he had married one Mary Lee and began working with his cousin Matthew in the Vassar Brewery. While working there, a protracted revival meeting was underway locally in Poughkeepsie. Several people had invited John to go to the meeting, and in each case he refused. Finally, Matthew insisted that he go one time, to which he did go, but not just once. But night after night, he returned to the meeting house. With each night, a greater sense of his lostness before God gripped his soul. A deep indictment of his sin caused him a terrible fear at the thought of standing before God upon the moment of death. He was so assured of his impending judgment that upon returning from a meeting one night and finding his wife sleeping, roused her awake saying, quote, how can you rest when your husband is going right down to hell, end quote. One night after the meeting, John was in such anguish and fear that he could not move. He stayed until most of the people had left the room. In tears, he asked a handful of men that remained to pray for him, saying that he would not leave until he had been given forgiveness and peace. About a half a dozen men gathered around him and began to pray. John responded by pouring out his heart. One preacher said that he had never heard such a desperate begging for salvation like what came from John Vassar that night. One minister took a Bible and attempted to point John to Christ. And although he had responded with some amount of calmness, there was still no peace in his soul. But the story was far different the next night. When John entered the meeting at the following evening, everyone knew that a transformation had taken place in the young man's life. One eyewitness said, quote, he was rejoicing in a Savior's pardoning love. There was a rapture on his face. There was a glory in his soul. There was glory in that old prayer room, too, as he told us that evening of God's own peace and the preciousness of Jesus, end quote. John immediately began to be a sponge of God's word. As he still worked in the brewery, he was constantly meditating and memorizing the Bible. He began also to talk to everyone around him about their relationship with God. He soon developed into a man of great prayer. He became known so much for his praying that one of his co-workers said of him, quote, well, there is one spot in this brewery that is better than any church in Poughkeepsie, and that is where that man prays, end quote. John Vassar was called upon to pray and to testify, to exhort, and to witness to the lost in churches and in special meetings in an ever-widening circle around Poughkeepsie. But it would not be too many years later that John Vassar's faith would be tested. It began in 1847, when the younger of his two sons was suddenly taken ill and died. It was not but a year later that the elder son of nine years old was taken as well in an illness that lasted but a few hours. One can imagine the loss of two children within one year was a devastation to both parents, but the toll that it took on Mary Lee, his wife, was more than she could bear. She soon contracted tuberculosis, which at the time was called consumption because of how it seemed to consume the body of a person day by day, wasting away until death. Mrs. Vassar, was overtaken in death November of 1849. Although she was a believing Christian, John was overwhelmed with heartbreak. Witnesses say that this was the only moment they saw this normally cheery man distraught with grief. For over half an hour, John Vassar lay down and wept uncontrollably like a child. The loss of his two sons, his beloved wife, and his father, who he had laid to rest just a few weeks earlier, was seemingly more than he could bear. Anyone might come to the conclusion 
that such troubled seas might cause one's faith to be shipwrecked. But that was not the case with John. This now lonely man soon recovered, finding strength and peace in the love of his life, the Lord Jesus. Through his sorrow, God carved out into his soul a compassion and a love for others that few could equal. With many of the people in this world that he held dear now gone, and an unquenchable burning desire to serve God ever growing in his heart, John Vassar, Uncle John, as everyone knew him, gave himself to be commissioned as a coal porter for the American Tract Society of New York. Now, coal portage was a means of evangelistic outreach employed heavily during the 19th century. Coal porters, like door-to-door salesmen, would travel from city to city, town to town, knocking on every door attempting to share the gospel, to distribute tracts and pamphlets, and to sell books by Christian authors. Uncle John himself called the job giving legs to Baxter and Bunyan. This put John in his element, talking to people, inquiring of their spiritual condition, sharing Christ with them, praying with them. As a coal porter, he would do this thousands of times. His travels were not confined to the state of New York. Dr. A.J. Gordon, a well-known Baptist pastor and author, a contemporary of Vassar who knew him, wrote, Uncle John traveled from Maine to Florida, from the Atlantic coast to the Pacific, on foot, on horseback, by rail, and by steamer, resting not in summer or in winter, in the one intense, eager pursuit of souls. And wherever you found him, there was the same burning zeal speaking out in his looks and in his words. As a full-time missionary for the American Tract Society, he did so at a salary of $150 a year plus travel expenses. This salary is minuscule when compared to the average yearly wage of $300 for an unskilled laborer. But this mattered little to Uncle John. His burning desire to share the gospel kept him constantly moving. Through the years, Vassar learned how to best approach every person with the good news. Often this was in a rather unconventional manner. John was blunt, direct, and to the point. He would encounter a person and quickly ask, quote, do you love Jesus, end quote. His questions had a way of disarming people, and yet with a tender and compassionate tone. Their response meant everything to John. If someone were to answer, By telling him where they went to church, John would persist that he did not ask them about their church. He was blunt with Christian brothers and sisters as well. Once he was staying with some friends that he knew from back home that had moved out west, he asked them about their neighbors. The wife replied that she didn't know them and had never even tried to know them. John asked them, how long have you been living here? Five years next spring, they replied. John said, Five years next spring? Oh, my dear brother and sister, both of you professors of religion and yet living here so long without informing yourselves about the condition of those nearest to your doors. What a pity. What a pity. What would the Lord say to you? The husband and wife each looked at each other and bowed their heads in shame. John then encouraged them and guided them on reaching out to their neighbors. When he passed through weeks later, He found the husband and wife host to several in the community, all talking about the religious welfare of the area, laying out plans to form a church, schedule preachers, and organize a Sunday school. John had an intensity that was unmatched. In his journal, he gives a brief but stunning view of his activities. Quote, I visit frequently 40 families a day, have a meeting somewhere every night, and speak to three Sunday schools where practicable every Lord's Day. I have conversed with over 3,000 people during the last three months on the subject of personal religion and feel that for this city, a wonderful blessing is in store, end quote. John was fearless, too, when it came to sharing Christ. John once had the opportunity after the Civil War to meet President Ulysses S. Grant, After dutifully paying him the respect that is due the office of Commander-in-Chief of the United States, he held on to the President's hand until he had spoken to him of the Lord Jesus Christ and then asked him 
if he had been born again. While he was traveling through Salt Lake City, Utah, he came into the home of the Mormon church leader Brigham Young, and he made the same gospel appeal. the Civil War started in 1861, John Vassar thought like many Americans that the war would be over in a matter of months. But as the months turned into years, and the newspapers relayed the staggering numbers of casualties growing higher and higher, John knew that he needed to be among the soldiers. He could not volunteer for he was nearly 50 years old by this time. He asked the American Tract Society for a new commission to serve as a chaplain in the Union Army. They consented and in June of 1863, he was inside the ranks of the Union soldiers. Not long after he arrived, he along with a number of other Union soldiers were captured in Virginia by General Jeb Stuart's cavalry. John was suspected of being a spy by the soldiers and was brought to the general for questioning. But as they made their way to the general, they quickly realized that this man was no spy. In his zeal for the Lord Jesus, He did nothing but pray and preach and try to talk to these men about the Savior every moment of the journey. When Jeb Stewart asked him who he was and what he was doing with the Union Army, Uncle John said, I am working as a call porter for the American Track Society to try and save the souls of the dear boys that fall around me every day. General, do you love Jesus? The courtly general answered, I know that good old society and have no fear of their emissaries. Characteristic of his persistence, John said, But my dear General, do you love Jesus? Taken aback by his boldness, one of the officers that endured his constant questioning on the way to the General pleaded with Stuart, saying, quote, General, take this man's promise that he will not tell of our whereabouts for the next 24 hours and let us see him out of our lines or we will have a prayer meeting from here to Richmond. End quote. The General agreed and Uncle John was released and made his way back to the Union lines. During the war, he tirelessly did all he could to comfort the soldiers, while at the same time pointing them to Christ. He would show up at a camp with books and literature as well as paper, pencils, and sewing needles, anything that he could acquire that would meet their needs. As he passed them out, he would remind them, quote, Now, boys, don't forget the prayer meeting the chaplain is going to have this evening. Come, dear boys and let us ask God to bless us, end quote. He would also conduct worship services where he pleaded with men to prepare their souls for the world to come on the very spot where hours later many of them would enter into that world. He spent a great deal of time preaching and ministering among the neglected black regiments of the Union Army where thousands would come and hear him preach. He would continue to reach out to the black community with the gospel for years after during the time of Reconstruction. After the war, John went right back to colporting, going from house to house, inquiring of the spiritual condition of every family. He would take whatever measure needed in order to win a soul to Christ. He once stopped at a farm where lived a young man that was deeply shaken by the message at a meeting the night before. He asked to speak to the young man, but the family had no idea where he had gone. Uncle John looked around among the barns to no avail, trying to find the young man. Just as he was about to leave, he saw the door of a corn crib that was barely open. He went in and found a very large barrel called a hogshead. When he looked inside, he saw the teenager trembling in tears. John climbed in the barrel and kindly spoke to the young man praying with him. By the time they both climbed out of the barrel, the boy had experienced the joy of receiving Christ as his Savior. But there were many times John felt powerless to help the people he encountered. He once stopped at a home where lived a very poor woman. And as they talked, the woman broke down into tears. She was a believer, but her husband was not. He did not only refuse to believe on Christ, He was an infidel. He despised the church and blasphemed its God any chance he had. He would have nothing to do with Christianity or the Bible, worse yet, 
He ridiculed her for her belief in Christ and flew into a rage any time she brought up the matter in his presence. She pleaded with Uncle John to pray for her husband to be saved. In tears, John earnestly prayed that God would open up such a hardened heart. As Uncle John was departing, she begged him to leave her a Bible, for they didn't have a single one in the house. John placed one in her hands and walked on to his next destination. John Vassar had not gotten over the hill away from the house when the infidel husband came home. When he saw the Bible on the kitchen table, he flew into a rage. He snatched up the Bible and his axe and made his way out behind the house where he chopped wood. He placed the Bible on the chopping block and then with a violent swing, cut the Bible into two pieces. Going back into the house, he flung half of the Bible at his wife's feet. In a tone of mockery, he said to his wife, quote, As you claim a part of all the property around here, there is your share, end quote. With his wife crying, he stormed out of the room, throwing his half in the closet where he kept his tools. Months passed as the wife continued to bombard heaven in prayer for her husband. On one cold, wet winter's evening, as the husband had little to do, he was looking through the house for something to read. While looking through the closet, hoping to find an old newspaper or a pamphlet, anything to snap the boredom of the moment, he stumbled upon the mutilated Bible. Looking to make sure his wife was not around, he picked up the torn book, tossed it open, and began to read. As providence would have it, the book opened to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15. The words appearing at the top of the page were these, And he said, A certain man had two sons. It was the parable of the prodigal son told by Jesus. As he read, he was captivated by the vivid narrative, that is, until the story came to a sudden halt at the jagged edge of the page. What would become of this humiliated son when he returned to his father? To finish the parable, he would need to find the other half of the book. He stealthily looked here and there all over the house, trying not to arouse any suspicion he checked dresser drawers and cabinets, trying to find the part belonging to his wife. It was nowhere to be found. After what he had done to the book to begin with, she no doubt hid it as best she could. Finally, his desperate need to hear the end of the divine teaching conquered his pride. He begged his wife for the other half, which she quickly retrieved. Her husband read it, then read it again, and then again. T. E. Vassar, Uncle John's biographer, gives a fitting end to what happened to the infidel. Quote, Need the outcome of the whole be told? Another wanderer fell at the father's feet. Another penitent was folded in the father's arms. Another bitter opposer became the champion of faith, which all his life he had labored to destroy. End quote. John E. Vassar, spent the remaining years of his life as a simple coal porter. By then, he focused his efforts on the East Coast. He specialized in helping pastors. He would arrive at a church at the request of a pastor, organize protracted meetings. He would lead door-to-door -door evangelism and would stay until a reviving work of God was underway. He kept this up year after year, even in the twilight years of his life. As a matter of fact, as his body began to show signs of age and weakness, the American Tract Society forced him to sign a document that imposed strict requirements that he stay home for extended periods of time, to which he complied for the most part. But by December 6th, 1878, the tired, worn body of Uncle John could go no further. His remaining family was called to be by the side of this soldier of the cross as he was discharged to glory. In his final moments, he was heard to whisper, quote, farewell, farewell, end quote. And then his last word was a faint whisper, quote, hallelujah, end quote. From there, he slipped into the presence of the Jesus he loved so much.
the many that spoke at his funeral, Dr. J.D. Fulton said that America would yet venerate the name of John Vassar as England venerates the name of John Bunyan, the author of Pilgrim's Progress. Sadly, to the detriment of the church as a whole, this prophecy did not come to pass. Uncle John Vassar is largely forgotten in our modern era, but as we encounter him on the dusty pages of history, we do see a man who is the epitome of the one who came to seek and save that which was lost and shared in the delight of the psalmist's melody. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Forgotten is written and produced by me, Bonnie Brown. You can find out more about this show at ForgottenPodcast.com. I'm also on Facebook at Facebook.com slash Forgotten Podcast. Every month, two new episodes of Forgotten are released publicly. But in the off weeks, I do produce additional episodes called Forgotten Glimpses. These are episodes with the same encouraging and inspiring stories, the same production quality, only a little shorter. These are available through Patreon, a safe and secure website that allows people to support individual creativity. For just $5 a month, you can help support the production costs of this podcast and get more forgotten in your life. Just go over to ForgottenPodcast.com slash support for more information. Forgotten is also available on various podcasting apps such as iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, and Downcast. Be sure to stop into iTunes and leave a review. And as always, thanks for listening.